This short video considers some of the benefits of archiving research data and highlights ethical aspects such as gaining consent from respondents and confidentiality of personal data. Why should I archive my data? In the past, and still today in some cases, researchers have been reluctant to share their data. This might be because they fear someone else might get the credit for the work they have done, or perhaps they want more time to do their own analysis. However, most funding bodies are now viewing research data as a public resource and insisting that data are put into the public domain in a timely fashion. There are many advantages to sharing data, including encouraging scientific inquiry and debate, promoting innovation and potential new uses of the data, possible new collaborations between researchers, maximizing transparency and accountability, encouraging the improvement and validation of research methods, eliminating the need to collect the same data again, thus reducing time and costs, increasing the impact and visibility of the research. General principles for archiving might include publicly funded research data or a public good which should be made openly available in a timely and responsible manner. Sufficient metadata should be recorded and made available to enable others to understand the research and the potential reuse of the data. Researchers should have a limited period of privileged use of the data collected to enable them to publish the results of their research. This time might vary but is expected to be no longer than two years. All users of the data should acknowledge the sources of their data and abide by the terms and conditions under which they are accessed. You should not be able to identify individuals from archived data. With quantitative data, anonymization is relatively straightforward. You might, for instance, remove direct identifiers. This would include names, addresses, phone numbers, etc. These are not usually necessary for secondary research, but are collected for checking purposes or to enable follow-up. These variables should be replaced by a code in the data. You might aggregate or reduce the precision of a variable. For example, rather than the full birth date of an individual, you might just record the month and year. If the values for an individual respondent are unusual within the wider group researched, you could collapse unusually large or small values into a single code. For example, a top code of 50 hectares or more could be applied to land ownership. With qualitative data such as interview transcriptions, removing identifiers could distort the data. One suggestion is to use pseudonyms or replacement terms or vaguer descriptions. For example, instead of the respondent's real name, Cathy for instance, you could use a pseudonym replacing every occurrence of Cathy with Jane in all the transcripts. Instead of Station Hill Primary School, you could use a primary school. When making these changes, keep a copy of the original data for internal use and keep a log of all replacements used. If you have audiovisual data to anonymise, this is much more of a challenge. If this is likely to be an issue, it is better to obtain the participant's consent to use and share the data unaltered. Informed consent is an ethical requirement for a lot of research. When gaining consent, you must make provision for sharing and archiving the data. Respondents should be given information on the purpose of the research and what is involved if they agree to participate. Any benefits or risks to them as individuals must be made clear. They should also be told how you are intending to use the data, how it is to be stored, and how you are planning on ensuring confidentiality of their personal data. If you are intending to use audiovisual data such as recordings or photos, you should state this clearly. Some might agree to complete a questionnaire but might not want photos of themselves to be made public. If your research involves working with children, you must gain consent from the parent or guardian as well as from the child, assuming the child is able to understand what's being asked of them. So, what should I archive? Of course, when we archive data, it is not just the data that we archive. Many data files are of limited use without the accompanying documentation. At the minimum, your archive should include the activity protocol so others can clearly see the focus of your research. 
the data management plan to show the steps you intended to follow to ensure high quality data. If you have used a data entry system, then this should be included. The field worker manual will detail the procedures used to collect the data. Include the blank questionnaires. Adding variable names to the questionnaire would be useful. The data quality report would highlight any problem areas in the data and give suggestions for its use. The metadata document is used to describe the data, etc. So to summarise, there are clear benefits to archiving and sharing, but there are also responsibilities. You must ensure the confidentiality of your respondents, ensure you have informed consent from respondents, and your data have been anonymised. Think of data sharing as a two-way process. If you are not willing to share your data, you cannot expect others to share theirs with you. The section of the support pack on data ownership includes further resources on this issue.